about that later, I guess. All right, Grant, take it away. Give it up for Grant. Thank you. Let's enter full screen. Uh, how many people here are really into the WWE or WWF? Yeah. One proud hand in the back. Um, if you've ever seen one of those, you know, they always begin, they're like, let's get ready to rumble. You know, like the guy has to come on the stage and it's going to be a big fight. And I kind of want you to think of That's that tonight. That's what we're doing here. This is fight night. Okay. Fight night. Let's get ready to rumble. We're going to bring on two titans of computer science tonight. One of them is going to emerge victorious and one of them will go home shamed. Shamed, I say. Lady Ada? Not Lady Ada. Uh, we begin our journey in the Zen of Python. The Zen of Python is kind of like a poem. It's like a set of rules. I don't really know what it is. Programming languages don't have Zen. So it's just a weird thing that's part of a weird culture, which is Python. Welcome to our weird group. Uh, if you have an interpreter open, type import this. That will bring your Zen to you. Uh, it's like 15 or 16 lines. It was written by Tim Peters. And uh, when I first found the Python Zen, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Let me read through it, kind of figure out what it's about. And it had these two lines in it. It said, simple is better than complex. Complex is better than complicated. I was thinking for a moment, I was like, so, but what, what's really the difference between complex and complicated? So I went to the dictionary, go to Webster's, open up complex. It says, blah, 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 C, complicated. <laughs> uh, wait a minute, I know where this is headed. I go to complicated, it says, blah, 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 C, complex. And I think, oh gosh, circular definitions. What are we going to do about this? Well, I want to take us back in time to the 1980s. You have to like rewind your brain to before Facebook, before Google, uh, before the internet, right? Before all these things, you had uh, a couple of titans of computer science. And in the first corner of our fight night is Donald Knuth. Ooh. You know, like you're supposed to imagine, right? He like comes on the stage, he's this titan. He's got some heavyweight belt. Donald Knuth's heavyweight belt he is known as the Isaac Newton of computer science. That's a pretty big deal, right? Like it's, I, I could not make a bigger deal about this man. He is so influential on all the computing that you and I have ever done. He's best known for one of his liter literary works. It's called The Art of Computer Programming. And in I think six volumes, is it six? Five? He's not, he hasn't finished the six. This is going to be, this is like his life's work. His magnum opus is the art of computer programming. I bought the volumes back when there were only three. I thought about dragging it here, but it is so heavy. I was like, no, I'll spare my back. Uh, I don't want to drag that out here. Uh, but you should go on Amazon. You should buy a copy tonight just to pay your tribute to this Titan. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus at Stanford University. He's still alive. Like he still does talks. Uh, they're very good. You should go and, you know, in your lifetime, see him speak. If you've ever heard of big O notation, or what we would call asymptotic complexity, how many people have ever uh, enjoyed or found the bane of big O notation? Yeah, you have this guy to blame for that. This is his fault. He's the one who tediously and in great detail determined and uh, documented the big O notation of all the core data types, all the core algorithms you've ever worked with. In fact, the second volume of his work is just called sorting. Like he wrote 2000 pages on sort. There's a lot there. And he's also known for the tech computer typesetting system, uh, sometimes referred to as LaTeX, basically a very fancy, uh, what, what would you say, whizzy whim kind of text editor. In the other corner, our other titan of computer science is Douglas McElroy. And Doug is best known for a little operating system called Unix. You ever heard of this one? Like he was the head of research at Bell Labs. He was uh, one of the people that Dennis Ritchie uh, and Kernighan reported to 
as they're developing this operating system that they would eventually go on to win a Turing Award for. Like, again, it's hard to make a big enough deal about this guy. He is sometimes known as the Unix philosopher. How many people have ever heard of the Unix philosophy? The very first item in the Unix philosophy is to do one thing and to do it well. That's this guy. He's sometimes known as the Piper of the Shell. I know it sounds like, I, I tried to think of a Pied Piper joke, to like a slight slip in here, but I couldn't think of one. How many of you have ever piped the output of one command into another? You have him to blame for that, right? He was a huge fan of shell programming and he developed a number of Unix tools, diff, sort, transliterate, join, graph, spell, speak, and he's still alive. He's a professor at the Dartmouth College. Back in the 1980s, without any internet, people had to learn things. They couldn't just Google it. They couldn't get it on their social media. So there were magazines. <laughs> I know this is a strange idea. So imagine a printed thing and then, and then like there were words inside it and you would open that up on a Friday night and you would kind of like flip through this. And back in the 1980s, uh, John Bentley, he published this magazine called Programming Pearls. And he invited Don Knuth, who is a big fan of something called literate programming, and Doug McElroy to contribute to the magazine. Doug was a big fan of shell programming. And he said, let's throw down, Doug actually proposed this. He said, let's throw down a challenge and we'll publish our solutions and we'll see who does better. So here was the challenge. You gotta read a file. You've got to parse the words in the file. You've got to tally the frequency of each word and print the top 10. Wow. Well, by today's standards, how does this challenge feel? <laughs> it's like an interview question, right? It's like, so you couldn't do that. We don't want to bring you on site. It was nice meeting you. Good luck. But back in the 1980s, this was like, we should get the two smartest people alive, <laughs> have them solve this problem, and then we'll publish it in a magazine so that everybody can read it. And this was actually a really widely distributed magazine. So they agree to this. And you have to understand, for Doug to propose this challenge with Don was a little bit like crazy because Don Knuth was such a titan of programming that he wouldn't just submit something brilliant he would prove that what he submitted was the best possible thing anyone could do. <laughs> and he would prove that it was optimal and true and everything. And it was like, boom, you cannot do better. I've proven it. <laughs> you know, that was, that was what he was going up against. So Don, uh, he tackles this problem. He introduces <laughs> at the time a data type that very few people had ever even heard of. It's called a prefix tree or try. It comes from the word retrieval. He proves that this is optimal in time and space. You can do no better than this data type. Uh, and he writes it in his literate programming style. Now understand that Don Knuth, being professor emeritus at Stanford working on the art of computer programming, this guy is like an uber academic. Literate programming serves his needs really well because when he writes an algorithm, he needs to publish it in a paper. He needs to prove that it's correct. He needs to test it. He needs to get it, you know, typeset and all these things. And so he really developed literate programming around that idea. So he could take one program and he could feed it through a compiler. He'd get an executable. He could feed it through a typesetter. He'd get something he could publish. He could feed it through a test system. He'd see all of his test cases pass. And they decide to publish this in programming pearls. Anyone want to guess what this solution weighs in at? How many pages of the magazine? eight and it is abbreviated heavily right <laughs> this is a complicated uh solution here's mcelroy's solution <laughs> that's the whole thing he actually wrote it in one line he spent one extra paragraph describing each of the steps and he said i'm gonna let other people decide which of these is the better the first program here tr is called transliterate he's saying take all of the letters that are not a through z and convert them into new line characters. Then take all of the uppercase letters and make them lowercase, sort that. Now, as he sorts that, it's gonna put all of the words first. And he says, oh, look at this trick. I have unique, which just happens to have a dash C switch, which will go ahead and count how often things occur uh, in a row. 
And when we output that, I can pipe it back to sort, which just happens to have a dash n switch, which will sort numerically by the second field and dash r will do it in reverse. And then the said line says, only give me this number lines in the output. That was his entire solution. So uh, what's kind of interesting here in the modern day, this is a multi-process solution. He's starting several uh, processes. It's actually almost a distributed sy system. We could get a bunch of these machines together. We could start connecting them via the network. We could pipe this data from one to the other. You look hard enough at that and kind of squint and cross your eyes. That's a MapReduce thing, right? It's like, ooh, this is googly. Uh, it supports problems that are larger than memory. He doesn't have to pull everything into memory at once. And he's using his shell programming. So here's the question, who won? How many of you have ever written a literate program? How many of you have ever written a shell program? Who won? <laughs> Doug won. And this was what was so fascinating to me as I saw these two styles of programming. I saw them as really like extremes. Right? On the one hand, you have literate programming, which has all of this documentation and testing, and it's beautiful, and it has a proof, and it's got all this typesetting, and it's part of a whole ecosystem of tools for teaching other people the best solutions. And then on the other hand, you have this one-line shell script. Which of these would you rather maintain? I would much rather maintain the one-line shell script. And what's interesting to me is that Python falls between these two. And I want to look for a moment at some of what Python has that helps it in this battle. The biggest feature of Python, which is actually built into the language itself, is doc strings. We actually support this idea that you should embed documentation in your Python code. And where can you put doc strings? You can put them at the top of a file. That's a module. You can put them at the top of a class. You can put them at the top of a function. Now, there are only three different things that create a new <coughs> scope in Python. What are the three things that create a new scope in Python? Modules, classes, functions. Ah, isn't that interesting how those line up so well? So, oh, gosh. <laughs> this guy. Um, and these actually get saved in an attribute. It's the Dunder doc attribute. It sits right next to Dunder name. And because it's an attribute, because Python embraces this idea of introspection and you can take things apart, we build tools on top of this. How many people have ever used the help built-in function? How many people have ever typed help of help? Ah, some clever folk there. Python doesn't explode when you do that. It tells you about how the help system works. What's really interesting is that help is a function that comes from the PyDoc module. PyDoc was a set of documentation tools for how do we take these doc strings and display them in a really elegant way. And what I love about PyDoc is not just the help built in, but the fact that it's also available from the command line. So when you're inside your shell, type python m pydoc dash dash help, or just type a, a module name, and it'll give you something like a Linux man page. It really makes Python feel like it's part of your system. It's embedded in things. It works the same way as that Unix philosophy. If you go ahead and try python m pydoc dash b, it actually fire up a web server. It'll translate all of those doc strings into HTML web pages on the fly. And it'll open up a web browser for you so that you can browse the documentation inside a web browser. Somebody say, wow. 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 I was on a plane once. They wanted to charge me 40 bucks for Wi-Fi. And I was like, oh, hell no. I don't need that. I just need to look up the doc strings of a few modules. Fight off. Boom. Done. Run that on localhost. In addition to PyDoc, you get doc test and doc test is one of those gems that most people they just can't bother themselves with but Py doc test is so fun because it's a twofer it's a built-in twofer guys you're gonna write documentation and by write documentation you get to write it in your favorite way possible my favorite way to write documentation copy paste you know how you write some code you go to the python shell you try it out and you think hey it would be nice if I let future users know that this is how it works. You copy paste that snippet in, 
Now people look at this, they go, ah, yes, the solved linear function. If I give it two and four, it gives me negative two. Doc test goes and takes that and turns it into a test case. Like, boom, done. That's awesome, right? So uh, what's fun about this, what's really fun about this, how many of you have ever looked at documentation before? You're presented with a wall of prose and you carefully read through every line of that prose in order to understand what you were working for before you tried it out. Is that what you do? No. It's not what you do. What do you do? You scroll, you scroll for an example. You take the example, you copy it, you paste it. And then what happens if the example doesn't work? Do you carefully file, file a bug just as Lisa described and say, hey, I'd like to help you maintain this process. <laughs> or do you kind of throw your hands up and go, well, I guess it's quitting time. <laughs> example doesn't work. I don't know what to tell you. What, how can we go any further? This will keep your examples up to date because now your examples can fail. Ah, isn't that kind of scary? Doctest.testmod is how you access it from Python. It'll give you back this little name tuple, zero failed, one attempted. It's actually turned this into a test case. It's got a nice shell interface as well, Python 3-M doc test. I encourage you to do a dash dash help or go ahead and put any text file here. Could be your restructured text documentation, could be a Python file, uh, could be a text file, anything that's plain text. It'll go through that. It'll look, it's basically really simple actually. It's looking for the... <coughs> Three greater than signs, it goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. That looks like a Python shell. Okay, take the thing that's after it, call exec on that, compare the output using repr, it matches, woohoo, you passed. Now it's actually a little smarter than that because if you embed logging or you have print statements, it goes and it captures those print statements, it ignores those logging messages and it'll go and validate your output for you. The core developers read Knuth so that you don't have to. That's one of the sayings we have in the Python community. Canoe's a big deal. All of you should take the time to read the art of computer programming. And in fact, Knuth was really concerned that computer science was going to get dumbed down by new languages and things that would make things too easy on people. <laughs> so with that disclaimer, know that Python is specifically intended to make your life easier. Thank God. And if we looked at like a Python solution to the problem we had uh, talked about today, uh, if you look inside the counter data type, inside the collections module, it's got a most common method, which will go ahead and spit out the end most common by value in your dictionary. You could build a very simple Python solution using that data type. How many people know how most common works? <laughs> <laughs> we have the author here this evening. <laughs> Besides Raymond, anyone know? How, if you were, if I asked you, give me the ten largest in a sequence. How do you do it? Bubble sort. Bubble sort. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good start. If n is very small, maybe that's a good idea. In the back, sir. Maybe a heap. Maybe a heap. See, the naive solution is to go and sort the whole thing, like bubble sort. Maybe like quick sort if you thought, oh, we can do better than bubble sort. But it turns out Knuth tackled this problem. He said, we can do even better than that. We use a heap data structure. And because you're interested in only the 10 largest out of a thousand, we don't need to go and sort the 990 that come after that 10. The core developers read Knuth so that you don't have to. All right, who won our fight? Knuth? No, I don't think so. I think McElroy run, won the fight, but I encourage you to write Python code. Which of those solutions was complicated? <laughs> Knuth was complicated because the complexity of a tree, a prefix tree, was something that was irreducible. It is optimal. It's the right answer, but my God, is it complicated. <laughs> Which one was complex? McElroy. McElroy, because it was the composition of simple tools. You could write sort, you could write transliterate, and McElroy encouraged software reuse by breaking all of those down into simple tools that you would compose together in order to create complex behavior. Simple is better than complex, <clears throat> complex is better than complicated. Thank you so much.